I, uh, I was a youth once. It's one, of the, it's one of the interesting things that uh, young people's oppression is one of the few oppressions that everyone has gone through at some point. Um, and yet we keep replicating it. So um, uh, the panel that we're about to enter into is a group of folks who've been fighting the good fight and are uh, leading voices in the struggle. So um, this will be our first time doing a panel live like this. So uh, just to set everybody up, um, uh, we're going to um, have a little bit of attempt at production. So our production team is ready for this. But the ways to work, I'll just introduce uh, some of the folks in the different panel um, one by one and just bring them up. Um, so uh, bye to you, Anna. Um, great. And um, so I'm going to introduce um, uh, the panel that we've got here, again, building power through youth organizing. So we have Brianna. Hi, Brianna. It's so nice to see you again. No, it's so good to see you, Daniel. Yeah, it's amazing the spaces that, you know, how, how this all gets pulled together. Okay, so we've got Vanessa. Come join us. See, just like that magic. Um, <laughs> Ray. Hi, Ray. Hello. Um, and then we have Greta. Sweet. Hi, Greta. And uh, then we have Nikki, who will be moderating this panel. Hey. So I'm going to step off, uh, give you a chance to introduce yourselves or say whatever, however you want to set that up. All you. Well, welcome everyone to the youth panel. Thank you so much for all the people who are watching us right now. And of course, to this amazing panel. Um, I'm Nikki Becker. I'm a climate justice activist from Argentina. And today we are going to talk about the power, the power of young people because the youth have always been willing to give their bodies, lives and time to change because we dare to challenge the idea that seems to be normalized in the rest of the society and we are not satisfied with the world as it is. And that's why uh, we mobilize, organize, speak out and write history in our own world. So here we have four amazing activists from all over the world with different backgrounds, but something in common. They organize with other people to build a better world. Thank you, Vanessa, Ray, Greta and Brianna for being here. And we will start with the first question to all of you about why did you become an activist and also what mo motivates you to continue your activism now? Diana, do you want to start and then whoever wants to uh, continue? Yeah, um, thank you, Nikki. And um, it's so great to be on the panel of all young women. Um, so great to see the power of young women in these spaces. Um, Really good question. Uh, what got me into this work and what motivates me is the same thing. As soon as I learned about climate change and the implications it would have on my islands, I knew that I had to do something. Um, I'm from Samoa, so that's a small group of islands with a, a large ocean, a vibrant culture, and very friendly people. Uh, for me, my island and my culture survival is non-negotiable. And so I fight for climate justice because it is synonymous with fighting for my home survival. Um, like most young people and, and most climate activists in particular in frontline communities, we're in this fight because we need to be and because we know that the cost of silence is, is too great to bear. And so that's why I do this work and, and that's what motivates me to continue to do it. Thank you, Rihanna. Who wants to continue? Vanessa, do you want to go? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I remember 2018, that's when I started to do so much research about climate issues. I studied business administration at university. So I had no idea about environmental issues and the connection that we all have with nature. But from that research, 
I realized how much the people in my country were facing the impacts of climate change right now. And from that research, I realized how it is threatening the lives of the people across the country. My country heavily depends on agriculture for survival and mostly uh, for very many families, especially in rural communities. So that means the climate crisis means hunger, the climate crisis means water scarcity, the climate crisis means early marriages for many girls. So it is an issue that is affecting different sectors of our lives. And that's what really made me become an activist. And to really start the climate strikes in my country, I was inspired by seeing Greta do the strikes in Sweden and it really motivated me to do the same thing in my country. And the other thing that really motivates me is seeing millions of young people across the world demanding for climate justice and not just climate justice but all forms of justice and it's just incredible to see young people to see young women speak truth to power. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Ray? Hi, um, thank you so much for having me. So I'm Ray from the Philippines. The Philippines is a very um, conservative country. And so as a transgender woman, you could kind of imagine what it's like here. Um, but for me, you know, um, growing up, my dream has always been to discover the cure to cancer, which is why um, in college, I, my degree was molecular biology and biotechnology. But also somewhere along the way, you know, I've, I've kind of thought about it, like, if I do discover something, who is this going to be for? And that was also the time when I saw the barriers that women like me and other members of the LGBT face, even in science. Um, and that led me down the path of activism. So right now, I'm a member of Bahaluhari. Bahaluhari means rainbow in Filipino. Um, we are the biggest national democratic organization of the LGBT plus here in the Philippines. Um, and for us, um, the issues that the LGBT face are not divorced from the issues being faced by the rest of society. So we also believe that there are no rainbows for us under climate change which is why we also believe that the climate catastrophe is something that we need to be taking a part of. Um, and for us in the Philippines, you know, um, there's multiple layers to the climate catastrophe. You know, um, being a country in the equator, we are one of the countries that would definitely be the first ones to experience Actually, we're already experiencing the climate catastrophe right now with numerous floods and rising sea levels. Um, but the point here is that the Philippines is actually um, a very backward country. Um, we are um, very dependent on other countries. We're being exploited, you know. Um, and so there's a reflection there that um, countries like us, countries like the Philippines, have the least to do with the climate catastrophe, but we're also the ones who will suffer the most from it or be the first ones to drown from it. So that is also a conversation about imperialism, of colonialism, right? And so that affects us in multiple ways. Mm -hmm. And just like Rihanna, you know, it's like we are being thrust into the struggle. And what motivates me, you know, is seeing so many other young people like me um, people in this panel, people filling up the streets everywhere across the globe, fighting for our rights. That is what motivates me, and that is what makes me believe that this is a fight that we can win. Thank you, Ray. And last but not least, Ray. Uh, yes. Um, thank you for having me, and it's great to see so many other inspiring panelists. It's such an honor to be here with you. I think. Uh, I mean, I come from a very privileged part of the world in the sense that we have um, very high emissions per capita and we are the ones who are going to be probably impacted the least by the climate crisis. Uh, and so growing up, the climate crisis was something that was very, very far away from me. 
and from basically everyone. So, I mean, it was just, it didn't exist really. It was just something like, in a sense that, oh, a few degrees warmer, that, that would be nice. We have a very cold climate here in Sweden. But I, I sort of couldn't get my head around that because people were saying one thing that, oh, the climate crisis threatens our civilization if we continue down this same path. And on the other hand, people were just acting as if everything was fine. No one was doing anything. So in that sense, the crisis was non-existent. And so I started to read up on that, on the climate crisis, because I couldn't just understand this double moral, this double standard. Uh, and so the more I read about it, the more I became like stuck. One, the climate crisis is such a thing that one, once you fully understand it, you can't un-understand it in a way. And so there I was, and then I thought to myself, I have to do something. I, I'm, I couldn't just continue like before, knowing that all of this was happening and just sit back and do nothing. My, I couldn't just accept that I had like a moral duty that I had to fulfill. So, and also I'm autistic. So once I really decide to do something, I I go full in, um, I go all in. And, and so then I, I just thought that someone needs to do something and I'm someone so then I can do something. And like, just like you say, um, I'm, I'm also motivated by everyone else, by people who have been leading this fight for, I mean, long before I was even born, and uh, who have been, who are pushing all the people, I mean, uh, for example, within the Fridays for Future movement, but not only that, I mean, every single person on the planet fighting for their rights and fighting for the environment, um, and especially the people on on the front lines who are who are fighting often despite all odds those are the ones who motivate me the most and i think if they can do it then i can um it's like uh yeah and also just the fact that i need to do something i want to be able to when i grow up to look back and say that i i did everything i could that's also something that that really motivates me it's like this is the only right thing to do and i mean yeah it's just you have to do something I love that each person has their own story of how they became an activist, and it's very interesting to know uh, to know that story. And now I will ask you individual questions, and I will ask uh, start asking Vanessa because even though this is becoming clear within the climate movement, there are still many people who don't understand the relationship between climate justice and ra and racial justice. So can you tell us a little bit more about this and also your experience? Um, thank you very much. Uh, to me, climate justice and racial justice are so interconnected from the historical background of CO2 emissions and what we are seeing right now, it clearly shows that this is, these are issues that are interconnected. You realize that those who are affected the most, they are the least responsible for the climate crisis. And these are communities of black people, these are communities of uh, brown people, communities of indigenous people who are facing the impacts of climate change right now. And yet they are least responsible to the climate crisis. They are the ones struggling to find food to eat. They're the ones struggling to protect and defend their lands. They are the ones protecting and defending the ecosystems and trying to have access to food. While um, we see communities in Western countries rise their emissions with all of these things. And even when it comes to uh, the media itself, those who are at the front lines of the climate crisis, they are not on the front pages of the world's newspapers um, from telling their stories and also 
to talking about the issues that they are facing right now. And from my own personal experience, well, it was, that was in Davos when I was copped out of a photo and it's really a very hard experience to talk about because every time I get to talk about it, it feels like it just happened like yesterday. And it was the first time I felt uh, racism in the climate movement. And it's it was the time that made me question uh, my presence at uh, the conference that to question my activism and the work that I was doing. And I was thinking about many people back at home and communities that are the front lines. And I was thinking that I had what I would call uh, the opportunity to speak at at the press conference. And even while at the press conference, it was obvious that my presence and my message was erased. So what really hurt most was thinking about those who didn't make it to, to Davos and those who are trying so hard to have their voices amplified. So to me, we won't be able to achieve and get climate justice without putting into consideration racial justice as communities of black people continue to face the wrath of climate change again they are at the front lines and yet they are not on the front pages yet their voices are not being amplified even the solutions that are being talked about when it comes to to the climate crisis even in the solutions, there are injustices. These are solutions that will not work for all of us. These are solutions that will not work for all communities. And I think for us to, to achieve the justice that we want for the planet and for everyone, we have to decolonize uh, climate action. We have to amplify voices of those who are being affected right now. Um, we have to tell their stories because every activist has a story to tell and every story has a solution to give and every solution has a life to change. So I believe that the only way that we will achieve justice is working together, is respecting every voice, respecting every community, regardless of who they are, where they come from and or how they look like or what language they speak. We all have to work together to ensure that those from the most affected places and areas receive the justice that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Yeah, people often think that the fight for the climate justice is just about saving a polar bear far away, when in reality it is about fighting for all injustice. And now for me, to this topic, I want to know what it's like to be an activist in a country where activism is dangerous, especially as a trans woman, because this is happening in a lot of countries, Latin America, for example, where I live, is the most dangerous region, region to be an activist. And this is but also this is a very serious situation in the Philippines, where you live, and where activists are. Accused of being terrorist, can you tell us a bit more about this and also your experience? Of course. Um, Nikki, we missed a little um, bit of what you said. So, can you just ask that question just once more so everyone can yeah. hear? Thanks. Yeah. Um, no, I, I want to ask Rake uh, what it's like to be an activist in a country where activism is dangerous, especially as a trans woman. Right. Um, firstly, I wanted to be established here in the Philippines right now, we have an ongoing civil war. It is a civil war between the government of the Republic of the Philippines and the Communist Party of the Philippines New People's Army. And it's been going on for 52 years. And why is this important? Um, because it has repercussions for us, the activists on the ground. 
um, because the government has been unable to put an end to the armed revolution being waged in the countryside, what they have been doing is they have been criminalizing all forms of dissent. So here in the Philippines, for example, women like me, um, especially women like me, right? Um, whenever we so much as criticize the government, for example, when we demand justice for indigenous peoples, when we demand um, a just future that is worth inheriting and an end to um, the climate catastrophe, we get tagged as terrorists. Essentially, activism is being equated to terrorism here in the Philippines. That's what's happening right now. Um, and if you criticize the government, you get told that you are an armed rebel. That's what happens. And this is what we call red tagging, right? When you get called a communist rebel. And that has real repercussions. Those are not just words. Um, so many people, so many activists who have been killed, um, are activists who beforehand have been red tagged by state forces. They were told that they were um, members of the Communist Party of the Philippines. Um, and that's what's happening right now. I myself have experienced this kind of violence. Um, last year, we organized a Pride March um, here in the Philippines. Um, and because we were demanding justice and we were demanding for the government to be held accountable for all of their abuses, um, we were unjustly arrested. I, along with 20, uh, 19 other members of the LGBT, were slapped with trumped up charges. Um, and we were unjustly detained. I, I have been in prison just for speaking out. And during detention, you know, I've experienced multiple forms of abuses, um, gender-based violence. I've experienced sexual abuse in the hands of police. And it's grisly. It may not be something that people want to hear, but it is the reality that we are facing here in the Philippines. And it is, in fact, the reality for so many activists around the world, most especially when you threaten the way that our society is organized right now. So I know firsthand, for example, I have friends who are activists for indigenous people demanding um, an end to the pillaging of their ancestral lands, um, to indigenous people who are demanding um, actual action when it comes to the climate catastrophe. They are being imprisoned right now. Um, they are facing trumped up charges as, as, um, as um, just for speaking out, you know. Um, and that is really what is going on right now. Um, dissent is being criminalized. Um, but that is no excuse for us to stop fighting. Despite that, we are trying to reach out to communities, urban poor communities, to workers, to farmers, um, and organizing each sector. You know, despite that, we are not ending our call to demand justice. And that includes justice for us as the youth who are set to inherit a world that is on fire. So that is what it's like, you know, that's sort of a brief overview of what it's like to be an activist here in the Philippines. But like I said, that's no reason for us to stop fighting. And hearing the stories of so many people, for example, in this panel from other countries facing their own struggles, um, that gives us the strength to go on and keep fighting anyway. Thank you, Ray. I hope my Wi-Fi is working well now. <laughs> I think uh, I, I hope you are doing well. Um, Brianna, now you, you have lived for a long time on a small island, island called Samoa that because of uh, its proximity to a large body of water is on the front line of the climate uh, emergency uh, that you already talked. And what do you consider the significance of small islands than community fights in the global climate justice movement. Um, thank you, Nikki. Uh, such a great question. I think that there's so much we can learn from small islands, especially within our indigenous cultures. I always say that I don't think sustainability is something that we're trying to get to. I think it's something we're trying to get back to. Um, in my culture, there's something called ava, 
and this means the space between. Uh, there is, we believe that there is a space between human and human, and there's also a space between human and nature. And so we don't see this space as being empty. Uh, we actually see it as something that connects us. And so there's something that we hear often in Psalm 1 culture, which is, uh, which means we must tend to the space. Um, and it, it can also mean we must tend to the, the relationship. We believe that in the climate, cri the climate crisis is a result of people exploiting this va or this space between human and nature. And now there's much overdue tending to do between us. And so for indigenous people, we know how to live in harmony with nature because we've been doing it for centuries on this planet. And so, you know, when people say humans don't deserve this planet, I, I disagree because I, I feel like my village deserves this planet. I feel like so many indigenous communities deserve this planet because we've lived harmoniously with it for centuries. And so indigenous people not only deserve to have this this earth or this planet we're on, but we also deserve to have a voice when it comes to solutions, because I can guarantee you that there's so many solutions within our cultures, just like I know that there's so many solutions within this va that Samoan people know how to tend to. Uh, and so I believe that we need to start acknowledging this and, and start learning from more communities who lie on the front lines because we are not just victims, but we're actually the carriers of a lot of the solutions we need for this crisis. Thank you, Rihanna. And Greta, to end this round of individual questions, I would like to ask you what is the best way, or at least what is your opinion of the best way to build a more just world? And what do you think are the challenges facing the climate a moment this year. I've been saying, we, in order to create a just world, we need to listen to those who are most most affected, to those whose voices are being who who are being most oppressed. Uh, that is the only way, and we need to sort of change our mindsets, both when it comes to to our relationships to other <laughs> humans, but also our relationship to nature. Um, that once we get past that step, we, we won't be able to achieve any changes unless we we drastically change our mindsets. Um, and some of the challenges, I think, well, apart from the obvious one that we can't gather in large crowds uh, because of the corona pandemic, I think the biggest challenge the climate movement faces this year is that uh, now... Um, countries uh, and companies are making like pledges and climate commitments that sound really good but the devil is always in the details um like yeah, they can say we're going to be net zero by 2050 and uh, i mean they get away with it since the level of awareness is so incredibly low people don't know what i mean we don't know what those targets include we don't know what loopholes they include Uh, and what kind of emissions they exclude when in the reporting of those emissions. And I mean, it's, um, and of course, you can say that our targets are in line with the Paris Agreement, our targets are in line with what science says needs to be done to, to stay below 1.5. And it, the reason why we can say that is because we can cheat and we can um, like include and exclude Uh, lots of things like we can make these targets depending on fantasy scaled uh, mm. negative emissions technologies and so on so um and of course the general narrative is that now things are happening the us and the eu is leading they have committed themselves to net zero and china has committed itself to climate neutrality and so on and the media of course goes along with that um and uh so i think the biggest challenge will be to call that out In a, and to spread awareness uh, and of course to keep the momentum going people we need to we need to realize that this is a marathon not a sprint i know we want quick solutions we want quick fixes 
but to a problem such so difficult and so complex as this one uh, quick fixes and just small steps in the right direction without any actual structural changes will not be enough and um, yes they are better than nothing but we cannot be satisfied satisfied with something just because it's better than nothing because this is a matter of life and death for so for too many people uh, so i think that will be the biggest challenges in to to keep the momentum going and to not not uh, get tired and say like oh well we we've been doing this for so long can't we just settle this for now can't we just say a net zero emissions by 2050 is okay because we don't have any more energy to fight on uh, to keep the momentum going and to keep to to keep the fight going thank you Greta and this uh, question can we can be answered by anyone who want to um, we already talked a little bit about it but I want to know more about what are the challenges that you face as a young activist who, who want to go Rihanna, maybe, or Rihanna, whatever. Rihanna, yeah, go. I don't know. Um, for me, I find the most challenging thing is trying to explain to people how intersectional this crisis is. And I think um, so many of the previous panelists have mentioned this. Um, climate change is a byproduct of capitalism and colonization, and we know this to be true. There is no achieving climate justice without facing the cause and acknowledging the Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities that face its consequences to a further extent. And so as climate activists, we need to not only acknowledge this, but work on the intersectional ties of this crisis. Um, because we all know that in order to solve it, we must dismantle the whole system in which it was built on. And, and a lot of the time, this gets left out of the conversation, but we must always remind ourselves that climate justice is Indigenous justice, it's racial justice, it's, it's gender justice, it's LGBTQI plus justice. It's, it's all of the justices within this broken system that must come into place in order for us to say that climate justice is true. Thank you, Rihanna. Vanessa, do you, do you want to go next? Well, thank you. Uh, that, there's been a, quite a number of challenges from when I started activism. Um, in my country, it's not very easy to, you know, organize very, very big strikes and get to do strikes with students and different people because it's hard to get permits, especially you don't have when you don't have any big organization to help you with that. So that that was one of the challenges that I faced in my activism. And the other thing I really remember, of course, activism comes with so much negativity from different people online in person yeah those are also challenges that i may not be facing by my myself alone but also other activists face those very challenges and maybe to talk about uh, the challenges that some of the activists that i work with have really faced um We've had some of them getting arrested and that is really uh, challenging for them and also for us because it kind of makes our activism a very hard thing to do because you're always in worry about what could happen next. And the other challenge has been really talking to people because many times when we would do community reach out to speak to people here in Uganda, you get questions like, what am I going to gain from this? How much are you going to pay me? Uh, if you're telling me to stop doing this, are you going to feed my family? So there are kind of those challenges of you know, people 
saying they are not able to do activism because of various reasons, which is understandable because of the circumstances that some of them are in. And also many people would say, why aren't you uh, maybe fighting for to end poverty, to eradicate poverty? So those were some of the challenges that I faced uh, as that are faced as an activist, but what I can say is that if uh, if I'm fighting for climate justice, then it means that I'm fighting to eradicate poverty as well. Mm-hmm. As yeah. I have seen and um, we've seen how climate change keeps people in poverty traps, and when they lose everything, when they lose their homes, their crops, they're left with nothing. When I fight for climate justice, I know I'm fighting for gender equality for all to achieve zero hunger. So it's all about people understanding the intersection of all these things. And I guess that is like the current challenge I have, but not just me, but probably other activists as well to to help people understand the intersection of all these things. Thank you, Anissa. And the last question, is, I think it's a weird note. Okay. Um, the last question is for everyone to answer, because if you look at the history of all social transformation, youth have been at the forefront of all of the, all of them. But why? What do you consider the power of the youth to be? Greta, do you, do you want to start? Uh, sure. Um, I mean, uh, I'm not surprised. Uh, that's just something uh, I think that comes quite natural, that the young people who grow up are going to have an urge to to want to create a better world than, than their parents uh, did, to, uh, to sort of improve the state of the world. Um, I think that it's, that's a quite natural instinct. <laughs> But... Um, I mean, young people, we don't have, we don't use the argument. I mean, we can't change because it's always been this way. We are more sort of a, more sort of a, a blank, uh, an empty book, so to speak. We don't have uh, so many prejudices. And uh, I mean, we don't have our, our expectations on the world that it's always been this way. So it can't change. Um which lots of older people usually use in order to to prevent change from happening. Uh, so I think, and also children, I mean, we young people, we don't care as much as, as older people do about our social status because they are more used into this system um, and they, they are afraid to lose their the sort of status, status. We don't have... In a way, we have so much more to lose because, in this case, our future is at stake. But on the other hand, we don't. In that sense, we don't have much more to lose. Then, yeah, you you get what I mean. Uh, but of course, when it comes to the climate emergency, of course, young people are the ones who are going to be most affected, and I think that we can see that. Young people can understand that, and in a way, understand that there's a huge injustice here. And that we want to, I mean, we want to make things right because we are the ones who are going to be most affected by this. Ray, do you want to go? Yeah. Um, so um, I completely agree with what Greta was saying. Um, you know, if you look at history of pretty much every society, you know, it has always been the youth that has been at the forefront of changing things for the better. And it is. A natural thing you know for the youth to um, exhibit that in fact it is also why we get chastised right older people often say that we are naive that we are idealistic that we dream too much but i think that the problem is not that the youth dream of a better future the problem is that somewhere along the way those dreams get hammered out of us and we are being told to accept the system as it is. We are being told to accept the abuse that 
we face as normal, but it's not normal, you know? And so the youth who have the vitality and who have that very much needed willingness and daringness to dream, that is necessary for any social transformation, whether it's fighting for the rights of the LGBT, which I've seen firsthand many members of the youth are the ones who um, take progressive measures um, when it comes to gender equality, when it comes to um, the issues that we face right now, which is the climate catastrophe, right? Um, it's only natural that the youth as the inheritors of um, this world that is currently on fire. It's only natural for us to be the ones standing up for our rights right now. Um, and I suppose, you know, um, that is also a challenge for us as youth because uh, we belong to every sector in society. We, as young people, you know, we are also the people in the urban core. We are people in the LGBT. We are the women. We are the workers. We are the ordinary people. We belong in every sector. And so there is a necessity for us to link arms with each other and see that we are being abused by the same system and we need to be uniting to change things for the better. So um, I think that is why we have a very, very vital role in terms of changing um, things that we see right now for the better. Thank you, Ray. We are running out of time, but I want to also to hear your opinion, Brianna, on this. I completely agree with what Greta and what Ray have said. There's something about young people. We're always looking forward, and I think that's just the nature of the, the place we are in our journey. And because we're looking forward, um, there's a level of, of optimism that the world needs from young people. Um, and, and that's why young people and young organizers have really been at the forefront of these world changing movements. And if there's one thing that we have it is passion and, and hope and, and like Ray was saying, dreams that are radical and, and can truly change the way that the world works. Thank you, Rihanna and Vanessa. I want to hear about your opinion on this. Uh, I would just start by saying that when you find yourself in a burning house, you do everything you can to run out of that house. So it's kind of disturbing for the young people to see that the planet is warming and all the leaders are doing is to fuel to continue fueling the crisis and even make it burn more. So I think for me, it just really brings a, a disturbing in my heart to see that homes are being washed away, to see that crops are being destroyed, to see that people are struggling to have access to clean water and biodiversity getting uh, destroyed because of the actions of our governments, the actions of the leaders. So I am personally worried about the kind of future that, you know, we are going into. However much uh, people are fighting for the future, I think it's important for people to also understand that the present of very many people is catastrophic it's dangerous, it's scary. So if I have a present that is scary right now, what do you expect me to think about the future? So I think that's what really pushes young people to demand for justice because they're already seeing a present that is very unpleasant and you cannot convince them that the future is pleasant or beautiful and yet it's what they are walking into we don't walk from destruction to uh, maybe peace just like that yeah when nothing is done about it so if we are seeing destruction then we are going to do everything we can to get something that is much better to get a future that is healthy a future that is sustainable a future that is equitable for all of us. 
Yeah, and as we are set up meeting promises, yeah, uh, and we are set up with empty promises and we lead by example. So now it's time for action. We have three actions for you to do now for all the people that are watching us right now. The first one is to tweet or post in your Instagram story is something about the panel using no more empty promises, the, this hashtag, and tag, tag in uh, Friday for Future. And Nikki. this is the first option. This one. So, Nikki, it's happening again. Yeah. Uh, just pause for a second and let's see if the stream will catch up. Try again. Okay. <laughs> um, as we are fed up with empty promises, and we want to lead by example. Now it's time for action. And we have three actions that you can do to all the people that are watching us right now. The first one is to tweet or post in your Instagram stories something about the panel and using the hashtag no more empty promises and uh, tagging Friday for Future. The second one is follow an activist or a movement uh, that is not from your uh, continent to to continue uh, knowing more people and the third one is to subscribe to our newsletter do you have do you, i think you have all of the links in the in the chat uh, so, so yeah you have a lot of actions that, that you can do now now after this amazing panel um and if you are interested to discuss what to do based on everything that was shared from this amazing panel, please join the youth organizing and other mobilization in 2021 and beyond workshop. And it's a uh, on the left of your screen on the gathering online space. And great. Well, so I want to say thank you to this amazing panel. It was really, really amazing. And I will let Daniel and Anna explain what is next. Great. Um, so I just want to say thank you, um, everyone. And maybe I'll just repeat again, Nikki, some of what you may have just gotten missed. Um, so just again, on the bottom of your screen that you're looking at are some uh, different actions uh, that are being encouraged to do. So I'll just say them again. So tweet, um, and they have a hashtag uh, there to do that with. Um, so hashtag no more empty promises, um, and to tag uh, at Fridays for Future. Um, and also to follow activists from another place. That was an encouragement. Um, so from another continent, another spot, one of the values of having a global enterprise is the chance to hear, but let's not just make it a moment, but to continue that. So you can go to justrecoverygathering.org slash follow. Um, and then the last thing is an invitation to join friesforfuture.org slash newsletter slash subscribe as a way to subscribe. Um, anything else to add from the panelists or anything from you, Nikki, before we head to the next piece? Yeah, we had one more action uh, about uh, writing in a piece of paper, a letter about uh, that. I think you know more about this action. But, uh, you should uh, take a piece of paper and write a, a letter uh, with uh, the word. Remember the word, Daniel. <laughs> Just recovery word? for all. Yeah. Just recovery Great. for all. You can choose just one letter and send it to the email, to the email that uh, we will share on the screen now. Great. So why don't we just go ahead and I'll close um, uh, this. So we'll say thank you to the panelists. Um, thank you so much for joining uh, and for your words. Um, and uh, and then Nikki, Yumi, and Anna, uh, let's let's pull this off. So we're gonna try to set up a um, creating a global banner, um, and it's a little bit in that spirit of um, uh, I think what was said that uh, as folks get older, we um, we begin to accept uh, what is, and that that. We, get, we accept what has been the status quo and get used to it. And so as an act of solidarity of resistance, as an act of statement of 
who we are and the way that we uh, make a choice to continue to resist, to continue to believe in everyone. Um, we're going to create a banner uh, as a whole global enterprise. I love it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so this is an example of the kind of banner uh, that we're going to create. Um, can you put that back up? There's another example uh, just to show. So uh, yeah, so this one, Stop um, Funding Climate Criminals. And um, so what we're going to invite you to do here in a moment um, is each, each person, it, you don't have to be super artistic. I did this in just a second. Um, but it's you- very beautiful, Daniel. Thank you, Anna. I really did try my, I did try my minimum. This, will, this is my minimum. This is my low bar. I'll, I'll add to this. Um, but all you have to do is just create uh, a letter like this. And, uh, and then you'll email it. And uh, we'll flash up the email. It's just photos at 350.org. Um, and so we'll throw up that uh, email again. So you email, take a picture of yourself with the photo like that. Um, and, uh, and then you'll email it. See, Nikki's got the U rocking on. <laughs> Yay. Anna's slacking on the job, uh, but the S is in her heart. <laughs> it's so easy. My, you my, have room, to my desk's going to collapse. So I'm just. <laughs> 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 okay, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> um, okay, so, so you have a lot of actions to do. You don't have an excuse. That's right. We're yeah. trying to keep you uh, from being uh, what would be the armchair activists, people who just sit and watch like a TV, because consumers. They, they want you to be a consumer and we want you to be an activist. So uh, exactly. So we're inviting a couple of different actions just here as part of our global solidarity. And what we'll do um, over the next five hours uh, as people are entering into workshops or movement story sessions, um, uh, as, we, as those things are happening, uh, we've got a team who's gonna take all these pictures um, and put them together into uh, a little banner. Uh, so please go ahead and do that. Um, I encourage you to go ahead and do it right now. Just do a quick photo uh, you with a with a letter, any of the letters, uh, and we'll try to spell out just recovery for all. Yeah. That's the plan I for the day. I also want to just encourage one of the things that I always remember from the climate strikes in September when it was was it last not last year nobody did a big climate strike last year. The um, 2019 was. The fact that loads of people and especially leaders said how much hope and inspiration they got from the youth strikers. But it was like, why don't you do something with that hope then? Like when Trudeau joined the climate march in Canada and it was like, they don't need you to join the march. They need you to not buy a pipeline. So as well as like taking loads of hope and inspiration from this panel, definitely also think what can you do that is action in solidarity with the with the youth strikers and that yeah speaks to the inspiration that you're feeling so i'm not accusing anyone as watching of buying a pipeline but yeah definitely like use your uh inspiration for <laughs> yeah justin no more buying pipelines if that's on your to-do list check it off <laughs> I need it. Um, don't just don't do it um and also the <laughs> the theme that was picked up i just want to emphasize that i just i really resonated for me was um the the importance of it it's not just little steps but we're really looking for large structural change and um and one of the pieces of that is understanding the mechanisms of that of what creates large structural change is the driving impetus of people power and so that only happens when we tell our own story of how we create that power so in the some of the sessions that we'll be going into uh, there's some phenomenal workshop sessions including like some of the stories of how they've won from US local groups or building climate storytelling um, as examples of how we, we establish uh, and help people to see their own power so that we can be involved in fighting for large scale structural change rather than changing of light bulbs or minor actions that on their whole don't, might make us feel better, uh, but are actually covers. Uh, for how badly we should be feeling and therefore the size of the problem that we should uh, be dealing with. So um, we're going to head into workshops. If you haven't done this before, Anna's going to explain how to get right into them. You're going to go to your left and I'm not going to point that way because I keep getting it wrong. But where it says <laughs> sessions, uh, I know, that's right. Daniel's my glamorous assistant, uh, where it says sessions, uh, you'll be able to filter which sessions are live now. Um, and then choose from the kind of last P 
heap of amazing content that we've got to you. Um, lots of people have been asking if there's a clash of sessions, are they recorded? Um, so all of these big sessions, the, the kind of panels and the cultural sessions are recorded. Um, and then with the other sessions, we're recording as many of them as possible, but recognizing that we want to do that with consent of the facilitators and the participants. So as many as we can, but we're not promising all, and they'll all be available on the wrap up page and website, but we need a few days to like sleep. Um, and to figure out figure out what goes where, so it might yeah, be yeah, tomorrow. Yeah, sure. it will be <laughs> yeah. please sleep. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Great. So um, we're going to open up uh, the sessions now, so you'll be able to follow the instructions that Anna just gave you. Um, thank you, Nikki. Thanks for all the panelists, um, both this panel and all the panelists that have been uh, contributing to this. It, it just makes it such a beautiful experience to hear from from such wisdom and such knowledge and such uh, passion. And so thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, everyone who is listening in on the conversation. This uh, whole conversation will also be recorded and we'll be able to put that up later as well. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, Nikki. Thank you. I'll thank see you, you soon, Anna. Bye. See you later. Bye. Ciao, ciao.